Joachim. Amen. 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 Wow. What an amazing morning. I'm telling you, if you stayed home today, you missed it. You did. You did. Always worth being here. Praise God. I'm a, we're we're going to kind of continue talking about the glory of God. Last week, we, we talked about the glory of God. And this week, we're going to talk about the glory of God. And probably next week, and then we'll see from there where it goes. There, I, I had no idea there was so much to understand and know about the glory of God. But there is. And it's, it's very, very, I think, misunderstood um, in many circles. And so, or, or maybe not fully understood is what I should say. And uh, so we're just going to kind of expound on that. And, and truthfully, even if we do, we'll, we'll never fully understand the glory of God. It's, it's so big. It's so massive. It, it's all around us. Um, and yet it's who he is. And so the glory of God, I want to, I want to start today with uh, Exodus 33. One of, it's not one. It is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Exodus 33 is my favorite chapter in the Bible. Um, there is so much richness in this. And when, when I found this chapter years ago, I mean, it, 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 it started to mess with me in a really good way. I started to really see that seeking the presence of God is it's not a bad thing. It's a very good thing. And, and it's something that we should all be doing. And so let me, let me give you a little background to Exodus 33 before we get going. Israel, at this point, has left Egypt. So all those plagues and all those, th- all those things happen. Now they're, they're, they've left Egypt, and they're in the wilderness. And, you know, even in the wilderness, God performed many miracles, many signs and wonders. And uh, it actually says that the people believed in God because of all the things they saw, which I don't know how you couldn't. But they believed in God, but not only that, but they feared him also, which, which if you saw the things that they had seen, you would fear God as well. Because you've seen the power, you've seen his glory just manifested right in front of you. And, and, and to see those things, you would think, man, I'm never turning back at all. And so out in the wilderness, God calls Moses up into the mountain, up into Mount Sinai. And, and God meets with Moses up there, and he comes down once in a while, and he goes back up. And this one particular time, though, God goes up, and he meets, or, or Moses goes up, and he meets with God. I mean, imagine everybody is seeing this mountain on fire. It says smoke going straight up like a chimney. God's presence is there. They're, they are told to not even come close to the mountain. Don't, don't touch the mountain. Don't come close to the mountain. Only Moses can go up. And then God would call certain other people up with, with Moses at different times. But there had to be a lot of fear just seeing what was going on. I don't think I'd go near that mountain either. And so they're, they're, they're there. And on top of that mountain, this is where God actually gives Moses the Ten Commandments. He, he, he gives them the Ten Commandments. And Moses is up there for such a long period of time, that the people down below, they begin to kind of wonder, is he coming back? What, where is he? What, what happened? Where, where's he at? And they begin to say, well, we just got to move on, I guess. And so they have Aaron, Moses' Moses' companion, we'll say, his number two, which is amazing that he's Aaron's the number two, the spokesperson. And, and Moses... As he's up on the mountain, God tells him, you need to go back down because the people are beginning to turn away from me. The people are actually making other gods. See, they're going back to Egypt. They're going back to what they were taught in Egypt. And they're making gods out of the jewelry from it's from the women's ears and from the children's ears and any jewelry that they had, apparently. They're, they're just forming this thing, this golden calf. And God tells him, and as Moses is going down, him and Joshua, Joshua's with him. They're actually coming down the mountain, and Joshua says, man, it sounds like, it sounds like there's, there's war. Something's going on in the camp. And Moses already knew because God told him. He said, it's, it's, not, it's not war. They're actually down there partying. They're partying. They're having a great time. And they're, and they're, and they're sacrificing. They're worshiping another God. And Moses comes down and he comes to the place where they no longer can only hear him, but now they see him and he takes the 10 commandments and he throws them down, possibly symbolizing that they've broken the law already. And he's, he's angry. He's upset. He's frustrated with these people. And God tells Moses to go ahead and get up 
get the people together. I'm going to move you on to the promised land. But there's a big difference this time. God was always with them in the wilderness. Man, whether it was fire or, or it was a cloud, he was, he was always with them. They knew it. They saw the miracles. They saw that all the plagues happen and, and everything. They knew that God was with them. But something different is about to change. Pick it up in Exodus 33, verse 3. 33, 3. This is God speaking to Moses. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you because you are a stiff-necked people and I might destroy you on the way. God's fed up with their rebellion. He's had enough of their rebellion. He's had enough. And holiness, we've talked about this before. God is holy. Holiness must punish sin. Otherwise, it's no longer holy. We cannot stand before God because he is so holy and we are not. And the people, it says the people actually mourned when Moses told them, this is what God's saying, he's not going to go with us. And it says that they mourned. And And I'll give them credit. I don't know if this was... I don't know if this was truly their heart or not. I hope it was. But, but they actually uh, began to mourn. They, they took off their jewelry, symbolizing that, look, we, we, we just got to come before God's barren. We, we can't be putting on all kinds of pride and thinking that we're something and, and walking around with our, with our heads held high. We need to humble ourselves in this time. And they take off all that jewelry. And, here, and here's what it says now. And, and you begin to see, okay, there, there must be some kind of change. Because what would happen now in the camp is, is Moses put the tent of meeting. It's where he would go and meet with God. And other people could too. And, and he put it outside the camp, which to me maybe possibly means that I'm not even going to dwell with you in your camp. It's just going to be out here. And, and the people would have to go out there. And when Moses would go out, here's what they said would happen. A pillar of cloud would begin to descend and the people would come out of their tents and they would stand in awe and they would begin to worship as Moses met with God in the tent. It says that Moses met with God as a friend talks to a friend. Incredible, incredible story in Exodus 33. And the story continues on. Look at verse 15. I'm sorry, look at verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways so that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. The Lord replied, my presence will go with you. I will give you rest. It had to bring some comfort to Moses. But here's the thing. As comforting as Moses might have been at that moment, it seems, as we go on here, it seems that he wasn't comfortable at all. He wasn't satisfied with that answer from God. I don't know. Keep in mind, he, he talked to God like a friend. And, and maybe God said it in a way that was like, look, I, I guess I'll go with you. But I'm, I'm really going because of you. And, and I don't know. Maybe there was a tone. Maybe there was something there. Maybe it was just Moses being desperate and saying, just hang on here, God. That's that's not enough. That's not enough. Look at verse 15 and 16. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will anyone know that you are pleased with me and with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? You guys get that line? He's not only desperate, you've got to go with me. You've got to go with me. He makes a statement here that many people, many churches have completely forgotten. It is the presence of God that makes us different from everyone else. It is his power, his anointing, his his presence when you come into the room. The world can have all kinds. We have shows on TV of of singers and and all kinds of things that go on. You can go to concerts. But I'm just telling you, for the most part, unless it's some kind of Christian concert that's going on, there is no presence of God there whatsoever. But they're doing the same thing we're doing. They're up on stage singing. There's a big crowd. Everybody's into it. But the presence of God is not there. The presence of God will bring healing. The presence of God, God will manifest in many different ways to the, to the literal point that I don't, I don't know about you, but during our worship this morning, I sensed that he had moved into the room with us. And it wasn't just us singing and, and just, okay, let's, let's, make, let's make a song. He was here. He was here. 
You saw this morning the, the prophetic begin to happen. You heard possibly this morning even tongues being spoken. All those things are in 1 Corinthians 12, by the way, if you want to look those up. They're biblical. And you'll see the manifestations of God happen like this when God shows up in the room. And this is what makes the church different. If God's presence is not in the church, I would say either pull it together or close the doors. Because it's his presence that makes us different. Not religion. Religion can even be in a spirit-filled church or a, uh, let me say a charismatic church. We'll take the word spirit-filled out because I don't know if it's spirit-filled. You can, you can do the same things over and over. This is the time we clap. This is the time we jump. This is the time we speak in tongues. And it's just the same thing over and over and over. But when God is really moving in the house, you just don't know exactly what's going to happen. I believe fully that God gives a person a message ahead of time. He gave me this message ahead of time. I believe that God will set up the, excuse me, <clears throat> hand me my water. <laughs> will set up the worship team to know what songs to sing. But within that place, God moves and God does what he wills as he did this morning. This is the presence of God that we seek. I seek him even more when we, when we see people being healed, not because somebody came out and even laid hands on them, but just because the presence of God is so strong in the room. Where people's minds begin to be, be free. We sang so much this morning about the chains breaking. When people, when people are just set free because of the presence of God in the room. And I hope this morning that we'll learn something from Moses because we cannot come into church and just, okay, here I am. Now, now entertain me and now go ahead, God, just show up and heal people. There has to be a, a, a seeking like Moses is doing here. He's, he's saying, wait, 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 God, that's, it's not enough that you go with us. I need you to go with us. I've got to know. I've got to know. Just a, just a nice little thing isn't good enough. I've got to know that you're going with us. God, I need you in my life. I'm desperate for you. One of the things that, that has made an impact on my life um, in the past, and now just recently again, because God, God, had to, God had to shake me up a little bit, just recently, in the last couple of weeks. I, I began to, what, what I was doing is I was falling back, let me, let me put it this way, uh, uh, sometime last year, in our older building, in the last building that we were at, I came to a place where I was so just, God, I need you. I've got to have you, God. I need more of you. And I wasn't even thinking, God, because I'm going to preach this weekend. I need you to show up. God, if you're on the worship team, God, we need you because I'm not sure how I'm going to do if you don't show up. And all of those are, are fine prayers. But ultimately what we're doing is we're saying, God, I need you for something. I need you to do this for me. I need you to show up because this is what we need to happen. This, this, we need people healed. What happens, what should happen, is there has to become the spirit. And this is what God is stirring back up on the inside of me. He did it, he did it last year, and I, I felt myself, I could tell I was falling away from that. And he, he's just kind of reawakened me to the fact that I, I should not be seeking God because I want his help in the pulpit. Yes, that's true. But I should be seeking God because I want more of God, because I desire more of God. Imagine being married. You're married, and, and all you want is you want a spouse that will do things for you, but you don't really care about them. The church has kind of come to this place. We, we've just said, God, we need you, and God, do this, and God, do that. And you just rub the lamp, and woo, the genie comes out. There's a place where we need to be here now today in these last days where we just desire God so much. And if he heals us, he heals us. And if he doesn't, he doesn't. But I tell you something, that in the presence of God, there is healing. And there is chains that break. And there is freedom. And there is so much joy in the room. And there is laughter. And there's peace. And there's contentment. All these things come. It's, it's amazing. But when we seek after him, then everything else is given to us. It sounds like a verse in the Bible, doesn't it? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. All these other things will be added to you. But instead, we're always like, God, I need you. God, this. God, that. God, can you? God, will you? God, please. Just seek him. Go after him. He does say to pray. Don't get me wrong. He does say to pray. But more and more, we need to be seeking after God all the time because we want to, because we need him, because we just desire to be with him. If you're married when you first got married, or maybe you, you found this boyfriend or girlfriend, and, and, you're, and you're in those beginning stages, man, you're, you're not there for them to do something for you. You're, you're there because you love them. 
I just love you and I want to be with you and I, I want you to be with me. And this is the, the relationship that Moses is having with God, the stirs that are, God, you're going to have you. I need you, God. You need to be with us, God. You change everything. Look at verse 17. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Again, God says, I'm going to be there. I'm going with you. So it's interesting, but, but some of us, when, when God first said to Moses, I'm not going with you, I'm not going. There's a lot of us in this room that actually will say, oh, okay. And we walk away and we're satisfied with God just saying, I'm not going with you. There's some of us in the room that say, God, no, no, you've got to go with us. You've got to go with us. And he says, okay, I'll go with you. You say, yes, okay, great. Thank you, God. And that's all that happens. But Moses was desperate even after a second time of God saying he'll go. God, you don't understand. I've got to have you. I've got to have you in our life. We've got to have you with us. You're everything to us. You're, you're, you're what matters to us. You must go with us. And he's just unsatisfied and he's desperate for more of God. And he has the audacity in verse 18 to say, God, would you show me your glory? He's not even okay with his presence anymore, with this just kind of sense of knowing that you're with us and the favor of God being on everybody. Now he's saying, man, I've got I've to see you. This is, this is the guy, this is the guy that saw God the first time in a burning bush. Most of us would have said, that's good. I'm good. The rest of my life, that's all I need. I will remember that forever. This is the guy that threw his staff down and it turned into a serpent. This is the guy that said such and such will happen and 10 plagues happened exactly as he said it. This is the guy that saw the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. This is the guy that saw the parting of the Red Sea, that saw manna every morning, that, that struck a rock and water came out of it. This is the guy that was on the mountain with God himself and that alone, that you would think would be absolutely enough. You would think that was enough of the presence, but he's still hungry for more. He came down off of that mountain. His face was glowing and he still had to have more. I, I'm not that way. And in and, and, and some ways that bothers me. And I, 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 we have to, are we going to see all these things take place? I have no idea whatever God wants to do, but am I hungry like that? To where you just are never satisfied. You've never had enough of God. This is an incredible place to be. Completely unsatisfied. There's this contentment, but I'm unsatisfied. It, it, they, they, they work hand in hand together. I think that um, if, if I were just to get up here and I were to say to you guys, like, man, we should all desire God more. I think we'd all be like, yes, I agree with that. But what tends to happen when we are in church is we hear that and we agree with that. But then we go out of here and we forget that. And we just don't think about it anymore until next Sunday. And then we talk about it some more and, oh, it stirs us up. And, and I feel like for... A while. And I guess pastors always feel this, to be honest. You always feel like somebody's not getting it. But we have got to get it. And if we're not as far as Moses is, then we've got to go further than where we are right now today. That's the, that's the big message out of here. Is that whatever you experienced in the past cannot be enough. You can't ride on what you experienced back in 1987 or back in 1992 or back in 1990, whatever, or back in 1970 or back in the charismatic movement and even beyond that. You cannot rely on that as if that was your momentum experience. That's, that's all that I need. God is new every morning. He has new mercies. He's, he, he has a freshness that comes out every single morning for us. And we should be hungry for him every single day day. But here's the thing. I, I know this, that I know this, that I know this. 
He is not going to drop out of heaven as I sit back in my chair and just fill me with the Spirit of God and just, and just have the presence of God just fall in the room just because I'm a Christian. There's a seeking that we have to do. There's a desire in our heart to see the presence of God in my life, to see it manifest, not just in the church, but in my living room, in my bedroom, in the car, walking along the road, wherever you might be and you're seeking God, the presence of God can come into that room and change everything in a moment. I think it's a part of what, you know, we were talking earlier uh, uh, that a lot of us kind of live a, a life that's defeated rather than a life of victory. We should be, as Christians, living a life of victory. We'll go through struggles, but even in the struggles, we should have victory. And we should know that, and we should be confident in that. But when we're not being full of the Spirit, and all we're doing is being filled with Facebook, and with Instagram, and all social media, and, and what's going on on channel 2, and 4, and 5, and everything else that we watch, we're filling ourselves with that stuff rather than the presence of God, and we'll never walk in victory that way. Saved, born again, going to heaven, not walking in the victory that is available to you. You have been made free. You're legally free. But like we said before, we're like a bird with a bird with the cage open. We won't get out of the cage. Tina and I got a new puppy. You open the cage to that door. I mean, you open the door to that cage. That puppy's like, hey, 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 what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Hey, that's how we need to be. Out. We've got to get out of that cage. But a lot of us are like that bird. It was, it was, I don't know, six months ago or whenever that was, I saw this, they were trying to release these birds. And you guys know this story because I told it, they're trying to release these birds out into the wild. They've, they've helped them back. And it's, it's, you know, a feel good moment. And they got the cage down and they opened the door and we're all just waiting. <laughs> the birds are like, I ain't going out there. You see that? Hey, I don't know what's out there. I'm not going, it's safer in here. And that's how we feel. We feel like it's safer inside of our cage. And it's such a lie. That's a lie of the enemy. Outside that cage is freedom. We got to be that puppy, man. We got to just get out. So, yes, I'm going to live my life, but we live it for God. We don't just live it in a radical way. We live it for God on purpose for him, pursuing him. I'm just telling you, there's a lot more freedom when you live your life for God than, than thinking that I, I can do this, I can do that if I don't live for God. There's a pursuit that we have to have. I looked up the word pursue just for some synonyms, and, and I, I know what it means, you know what it means, but it means to chase, to hunt, to go after, to run after, and I love these, to dog someone, to be a hound. Some of the, I don't know if the younger crowd knows what dog means, but, but most of us that are older, we understand it. It's, it's, it was dogging them. You're, you're just on the tail of somebody. You're, you're on their tracks. You're the hound dog. You're, you're saying, God, I need you. I need more of you, God. And you're just chasing him around, making sure that, that you catch him. That's pursuit. That's how we're supposed to be. And I, 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 I dare say that there's something wrong on the inside of us that we're not that way. And maybe, maybe you like me, you, you've got some of that. I've got, I got some of that, man. I'm going to pursue God. I, I, I know that I need him and I know that I want him. There's actually a side of me. I, I know that's alive. This is, I want God. I don't just want him because he, because he meets my needs. I want to be with him. And I at least have some of that, but I don't have enough. I, I, I need more and I need to continue this pursuit. Now, personally, I need to discipline myself in some areas of my life where like in the morning or something, I get up and I'm chasing after God or, or maybe it's every day just, just almost having like a regimen. We do it at work all the time. You, you set meetings constantly. When you're at home, you know when the doctor's office has to happen. I know every morning I get up and I feed our dogs. I, there's this routine, but we, we don't really have a routine with God. He, he's a fill-in. We'll, we'll, get, we'll get to God when we need him. And it shouldn't be that way. It should be good morning, God. You're the first person I've got to talk with today. And even if you have to do something first, there should be, like, I'm just saying, this is how far I think we should be. There should be an expectancy, like, okay, I've got to feed the dogs first because they're going to go crazy. So I feed the dogs, and I'm just thinking to myself, God, I can't wait to get with God. I can't wait till this is, I'm going to get this done. I'm going to go right to my chair. I'm going to get with God. I'm just saying, what if we lived our lives that way? How incredible would it be to live a life 
sold out to God? What changes would be made? You see, I think a lot of us as parents, our children saw us. They know that we went to church. We lived a Christian life. But there was no passion. And let me tell you, teenagers right now, they know when they see a fake. And you may have given your heart to Jesus Christ, but when there's no passion, you cannot even tell. And they see that. And all they know is you're making me go to church. This is boring. This is dry. I don't like being here. But when they see a parent or when they see a friend who's passionate, what if somebody at work saw you passionate for Jesus? Like you were on fire, like you kind of not can't help but talk about it. I'm not saying radically weird. I'm not saying that. Where you're Mr. Holy, Mrs. Holy, always got the answer for everyone. You, you, you're always coming in with these religious words, Christianese words. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about somebody who's on fire for God, who loves life, who, who believes in the power of prayer, who can talk with somebody and seem free and alive. That's how we're supposed to be living our lives. I hope this is as challenging to you as it is to me. Verse 19 to 20. And the Lord said, I will cause all my, so, so he's answering Moses. And the Lord said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. And I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Thank God he has compassion on all of us. But he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Kind of an interesting thing here, but Moses asked God to, can, I, I just want to see your glory. And God says, I'll, I'll, I'll show you all my goodness. I'll allow, allow my goodness to pass before you. God's glory is his goodness. God's goodness is his glory. You cannot separate those two. God is good in everything that he does. He is not an evil God in any way. Certain things are allowed to happen because he has a purpose for them. But it's a good purpose. It's not to bring evil. It's not to bring harm to you. It's not to hurt us. It's not to drag us down. There's always a reason. There's always a reason that God will allow certain things to happen. We have to trust him in that. And that's hard for us sometimes because we don't see the answers. We don't see down the road and he does. But there's always a reason behind everything. These last few verses are something that we really... I haven't seen taught much. I'm not saying like it's a new teaching. It's not. But I haven't, I haven't heard much of it. And so this is where I myself went a little bit deeper into this message and trying to understand some things that were going on. Check out uh, verses uh, 21 to 23. Exodus 33, 21, 23. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. Look at verse 21 again. Then the Lord said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. This whole picture begins to unfold and it is a foreshadowing of Jesus. Moses has been... A Jesus in many ways to the people of Israel. He's been the intercession person, the, the one who's interceding for Israel constantly, going to God, God, spare these people. I know, I know how they are. They're wearing me out too, but God, they're your people, spare them. And, and now Jesus, or now God is going to show Moses a foreshadowing. Did Moses fully understand it? I don't know, but you and I can see it now that the plan of Jesus Christ has been in the works since the days of the very beginning since the days of Exodus and even beyond that. He said, there's a place near me where you may stand on a rock. We do not approach God with stand, without standing on the rock of Jesus. You cannot come near God without going through Jesus. Listen to 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 4. This is Paul speaking. He said, our ancestors, now he's talking about Israel, where they're at right now. Our ancestors were all under the cloud and, and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized in, into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. God was opening up something to Moses. 
He was letting them see a glimpse of something here coming down the, the future. The only way to the Father is through Jesus. Look at verses 22, 23. When my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. We learned last week, and we know already because it's pretty obvious here, that if we were to see the face of God, full God, that because of our flesh, we would just evaporate right then and there. We'd be gone. We would die. His presence is so holy, we cannot look him in the face. But here's the thing. When we're placed in the cleft of the rock, you guys know what a cleft is? It's where a rock has separated, where a rock has been broken. Jesus, the rock, was broken. And we were put inside that cleft so that the presence of God wouldn't destroy us, but would heal us, that would forgive us of our sins. And only those who have been put into the cleft can see the glory of God. There was a, uh, many of you know this song. How many of you guys know the song, Rock of Ages? Rock of Ages, not, not the rock song, but the <laughs> Rock of Ages. That song was written all the way, I found this out, that song was written all the way back in 1775. And the first, they say the first lines were penned. Actually, it was put into a, uh, an article, a magazine at that time. I think it was called Good News Publishing or something like that. But it was published back in 1775, just the very beginning of it. it that the man's name was Augustus Toplady. Interesting name. But he wrote this as God was revealing to him some things about who Jesus really is. And he didn't finish that song all the way until, and it didn't even get published until July of 1776, a year later. He, but it's a pretty long song, and so he took time writing out those lyrics. But those first lyrics say, Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. He understood it all the way back in 1775, what God was trying to show Moses. That there's a cleft that I will put my people into. And I will pass by them. And they won't be able to see my face completely because they still have this sin nature. They, they still have this flesh, but there'll come a day where, where, where they will. But in the meantime, I'm going to let you see my back. And a lot of people will say this, that it, that it wasn't that you saw the backside of God. I, I, I tend to think it was both, but the words that are used here is almost like the vapor trail of a comet. That's what Moses saw. He said, I don't know, I, I don't know. It doesn't say what he saw, but something, some sort, a part of the glory of God. He couldn't see the whole thing because it would have killed him. But the glory of God, I believe, is real. I believe that it's not just in nature that the glory of God can be seen in many, many, many different ways. As we seek the presence of God, who knows what God may do, whether it's in this building, whether it's in your home, as you're seeking him alone. It doesn't have to be a corporate meeting. You get alone with God and you'll be amazed what he can do. <laughs> my, my last thought that I had here was going to be about 2022, but I think we've covered so much of that. This needs to be a year. I wish we had everyone here. I know it's the beginning of the year, and I know the weather's bad outside. But it also causes more people to watch us online, so you never know. But this has to be the year that all of us, Please don't let it be the person next to you. Don't let it be your spouse. Don't, don't let it be the, the couple that you just love here. Let, you, you need to seek after God more than you ever have, whatever that means to you. That's the best way I can say it. Don't be satisfied in 2022 with your relationship that you had with God last year, which was literally last week. And I mean that. 
Don't be, don't be comfortable. Well, God really showed up last week. Wow, that was awesome. And then this next week, we don't even seek him at all. Because that was incredible. No, every week. Every week we lean in. I can tell you this. Not every week is God going to show up and manifest in some special way to us. Sometimes these, are, these, these deep times, these are times where God just, whew, he just seems to move into the room. And then there's times where you just kind of in the zone and you're just praising God and you, you feel a little something, him in the room, but he's not as strong as before. And sometimes we kind of feel like, well, God, where, where'd you go? He didn't leave. He didn't leave. He's just the way he moves. It's the way he operates. He never healed somebody. It seemed like the same way, the same way twice, always doing something different, always surprising us. And so we don't know. We don't know what will happen from week to week. And excuse me, I'm going to lose my voice here. But in some ways, no, I'm not in Jesus' name. In some ways, in some ways, that should excite you. That should tell you, like, week to week, I don't know what's going to happen. Week to week, here, we don't know. But I know this. I believe that at least we're going to seek it. We're going to seek for the presence of God more this year than we did last year. And I'm hoping that every single week we just walk in these doors expecting. I'm hoping. In praying, seriously praying, that each of you will connect with God in a way that you've never connected with him before. I caught myself this past week saying, God, I want what I had last year. And I caught myself going, wait a minute. God, I want more than what I had last year. I'm not okay with, with just staying status quo, with, with living in the past. New manna fell on the ground every single morning. His mercies are new every single morning. And we need to know that the presence of God is available and new every morning. It's a relationship that we're supposed to have with God. And the relationship is more than coming to church once a week. What kind of relationship do you have with a good friend or your spouse if you're only meeting once a week? It, it'll probably fall apart, truthfully. Even if you had a good friend, if you met with them just once a week, you will not know them like you would if you were meeting with them every single day. That needs to be us with God. I know that I'm saying the same thing over and over, but I'm trying to get us to understand this. This has to be your responsibility. It can't be mine. It can't be your spouse's. It can't be your kids. It can't be your parents. It has to be yours. Yours. If you want to experience true freedom and true life, if you want breakthrough like we sang about this morning, if you want the chains broken off of things in your life, you've got to pursue God. He makes the difference. His presence makes the difference. His glory shining in our lives makes the difference. I want the worship team come up and I'm just going to have everybody stand this morning. We're just going to pray. Father, we just come before you, and I, I just, man, want to kind of recommit ourselves, God, even, even as a church. As a church, but God, I, I pray that, that each of you out there will say this from your own heart as well, and not rely on the church to do this, but you have to do this. But God, we commit to you that in 2022, we will seek after you. We will pursue you. We will chase after you. We will dog you until we have more of you. We will not be satisfied with 2021. We will not be satisfied with the week before. God, I pray that you would discipline our lives, not, not, not in a rebuking way, but there would be discipline on our lives to meet with you more and more, and especially every day, for some amount of time, whatever that looks like to each of us, God, but may we get with you and hang out with you and show that we love you, that we need you, that we want you. And God, I pray this morning because I've been here in this place myself where, where I, I didn't really necessarily want you. I know that I should, but I didn't really want you. And I pray this morning, God, that for those of us who don't know how to 
seek after you, that we would just come before you and just say, God, I don't, I, don't, I don't know how to do that. I don't know how to seek after you. I don't know where to start in my Bible. I don't know how to do this. But if you'll show me, God, I'll do it because I want to, God. I want to. I want to have that kind of relationship with you. So, God, I pray that you would show us over the next year how to chase you, how to be with you, how to desire you more. That as we get closer and closer, I believe this, that you will put a stronger and stronger desire on the inside of us to desire to know you more than even last week, know, more, know you more than yesterday. And God, should we fail and should we kind of fall away from you a little bit or, or just kind of ignore you some? God, I pray that we'd just shake it off and we'd get going again. That we wouldn't allow Satan to come in and, and, and cause confusion and cause doubt and unbelief in our lives, God. Saying, well, I thought you were going to chase him. You didn't do it. God, I pray that that kind of thinking would be annulled from our lives. That it would break off. We'd no longer listen to the voice of the enemy. Tina said, I guess you can look up here if you want to. I, I don't know. Um, I'm just kind of hearing from God. I totally forgot about this. It, it struck me in the moment, but Tina said earlier that um, someone in here, it sounded like in here, was battling with voices that are more or less demonic voices, voices saying that uh, kind of pushing you away from God. They just keep chattering. And as soon, I don't know why, but as soon as I said that, that came up again in my spirit. If you will lean into God, I'm not sure who I'm talking to, but very specifically, if you will lean into God and listen for his voice, and even if you can continue to hear the enemy's voice is you keep leaning into God. Don't grow weary in doing good. You keep chasing after God. You keep pursuing God. Those demonic voices will fade away. In fact, at some point, when you become fully submitted to God, they will break off. And you will not be bothered by them anymore. But there is a pursuing that you need to take in your life. This is for real. You cannot idly sit by and allow the enemy to torment you any longer. Break that thing off in the name of Jesus. It'll come from your own heart saying, I am not dealing with this anymore. I am breaking this tie, this, this string that Satan seems to have on me. These chains, I'm breaking them off. I'm not listening to him anymore. God, I'm going to lean into you. And I was saying earlier every day, if you have to do it every hour, every minute, that's what you need to do. That's what you need to do. No longer listen to those voices. They're lies. They're lies. I'm declaring to you that the enemy has been lying to you. He's been speaking lies into your ear and you've been listening to them or they've at least been taunting you. And this is the day. This is the day like right now where they need to begin to stop or they need to stop. I'm not sure who I'm talking to. There may be different levels of this in here, but it needs to stop immediately in the name of Jesus. And it's going to take you. It's going to take you. I've already asked God. I thought, God, should I, should I ask them to come forward and lay hands? And the answer was, was I got this because it's you. You've got to step forward. You've got to say enough is enough. You've got to begin to pursue God. You've got to open up your Bible. I've told you guys in the past, all you have to do, if you don't know the Bible very well, Google, what do I do about this temptation? You know, whatever temptation you've got. What do I do um, when, I, when I hear the enemy's voice louder than I hear God's voice? You can Google things like that. Be careful what, what you're, where you're going to. But if you, if you just look up scriptures, just say, give me verses about such and such all these scriptures come up. The amazing thing that happens is Satan hates scripture. He hates the word of God. Because every time you speak it, you're speaking authority over his life. And the Bible says that when we submit to God, that the enemy must flee. 
And see, part of that submission is not just, God, I give you my life, but it's, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you every part of me. God, I'm going to, this junk that I've had in my life, I'm going to read scripture. I'm going to begin to pull this thing out. God, I'm going to pursue you until there's so much of you on the inside of me, there's not room for anything else. And you've got to go after God. And I'm telling you, I don't care if you've been dealing with things for 20 years. You will break this thing off if you'll do what I just said. It really isn't a whole lot harder than that, but it's a lot of discipline. It is. It's a lot of discipline. I can tell you from experience. And most other people in here who have overcome something, they can tell you from experience. It's not easy. And it's a consistent battle that has to take place. And in the consistency, you will see your life changed. You will physically begin to look different. And you'll hear the voice of God and no longer the voice of Satan whispering to you. He has no power over you. The only way that he's got power over you is you give it to him. If you do nothing about this. The other way that he has power over you is if you have not given your heart to Jesus Christ. See, this this is the powerful thing here. It talked about the rock being broken and we're placed inside that rock. Jesus' body was broken on the cross for you and I. He, he, was a, he was sacrificed for you and I. When his body, so, so to speak, broke apart, we were placed inside of him. And when God looks at us, after we've given our heart to Jesus Christ, he no longer sees Tim, he sees Jesus. Not because Tim's become perfect, but because Tim is in Christ. And when he sees Jesus, come on in. That's what he's going to say at your end days when you stand before him. He'll welcome you in. And all we have to do is we give our life to him and we say, God, would you forgive me of my sins? Maybe it's if I'm speaking to that one person, I'm speaking to other people right now too, but maybe if I'm speaking to that one person, God, forgive me for listening to the voice of Satan. Forgive me for giving in to temptation. Forgive me of my sins. I repent of them right now. And what you need to be able to acknowledge is that Jesus died on the cross for you. He died. He was a sacrifice. He sacrificed himself. He literally laid his own life down, so to speak, and just said, sacrifice me because my blood will wash away your sins. When he died on that cross, his blood was poured out. He was washing our sins away and he died and they put him in the tomb, but he didn't just stay there. Because if that was, if that was all that happened, then okay, it was just another sacrifice. But the tomb after three days opened up and he was raised from the dead. And because of that, we have victory in our lives. And this is what I'm talking about. Legally, if you are a child of God, you have victory over Satan in every area of your life. It is available to you if you'll seek after God, if you'll apply the word of God. Every area of your life, these strongholds can be broken off in the name of Jesus. I do not believe that just because you were an alcoholic, you'll be an alcoholic the rest of your life. I don't believe that. Not if you're truly chasing after God and constantly filling yourself with his presence. That thing will break off. Yes, we have flesh. Yes, flesh is tempted. But we do not have to yield to it. Am I going to live a 100% perfect life? Probably not. And that's okay because Jesus has forgiven you. But we constantly go back to him. And we constantly say, God, I've blown it. I'm not, I'm not getting saved again. I'm, re, I'm reestablishing my relationship with him. Even after salvation, God, I messed up. Would you forgive me? And I'm starting over with you, God. I love you so much. And we move on. But if you have never given your heart to Jesus Christ today, then I am telling you, the enemy has a lot of control over you. So say this prayer with me this morning. We're going to ask Jesus to forgive us. We're going to ask him to come into our lives. Just say, Father God, everybody repeat it after me, everybody. Father God, I thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, I thank you for dying on the cross, for being placed into the tomb, and three days later, rising from the dead. I believe you did this on my behalf. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I believe your blood washes them away and I receive your forgiveness today. 
Fill me with your spirit. Change me forever. May I never be the same. I will walk with you all my days. I will chase after you. I will pursue you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, listen, I, I don't know who all that was for, but I would say all the more importantly that if you've been struggling with temptation, you've been struggling with fear, you've been struggling with doubt, you've been struggling with whatever it may be, hearing the voice of Satan, whatever it may be, and you know that you gave your heart to Jesus Christ today, maybe you just need, need this book. That's fine. You can get it today at our Welcome Center when you leave here. Stop by there. They've got a book uh, that you, you really need. Grab the book, begin to read through it, 